Thank you very much for that. Thank you for that tree. I stopped and visited it already, and it's a handsome specimen, if I say so myself. Uh, uh, what a pleasure to get to be here. Now, I'd heard about this enterprise, but I hadn't quite reckoned on how big and spectacular it was. Um, um, I'm not sure there's anything quite like this anywhere else in the continent, and it's... And I particularly like it because it, there's the, it, you know, I've only been here an hour, but just looking around at booths and things that people are doing, it's very clear that the sort of very practical get things done approach that we associate with the Midwest is well represented here. And that's very, very good news for me. Um, I'm going to be extremely frank in this talk today. And part of what I'm going to talk about um, is the fact that at the moment, looked at globally on the largest scale, we're losing, and losing pretty badly in the fight to make this planet work. And if we're going to win, or even come close, uh, it's going to take an enormous amount of just that kind of practical spirit. I'm going to try to, before the day is done, enlist you in this work that we're doing, and um, I know that you'll be awfully, awfully good at it. When I say that we're losing, I, I wrote that book, The End of Nature, back in 1989, which I gather was a year before this enterprise got off the ground, so about the same, we've been working on these things about the same length of time. In 1989, we knew enough already about climate change. We knew most of what we needed to know. We knew that when you, that, that the molecular structure of carbon dioxide traps heat near the planet that would otherwise radiate back out to space. And we knew that we were emitting an awful lot of carbon dioxide by burning coal and gas and oil, and that it was stacking up in the atmosphere. The only thing we didn't know 21 years ago was how quickly it was going to pinch. And of course, uh, you know, being human, our hope was that it would take a while, because then it would be somebody else's problem to deal with, not ours. But the story of the last 20 years is that it isn't taking a while. In fact, it's happening faster than we could have predicted even in our darkest imaginings two decades ago. So far, human beings have raised the temperature of this Earth about one degree. We would not have thought that that would be enough 20 years ago to do huge damage. We would have thought that real change would be a few more degrees and hence some more decades down the road. But we were wrong. The Earth turned out to be more finely balanced than people imagined. And that one degree, which works out to about two watts of extra energy from the sun per square meter of the Earth's surface, turns out to be enough to cause all kinds of havoc. Everything frozen on Earth is melting, and melting very fast. About three, four days ago, the National Sea Ice Data Center uh, said that the new satellite images were making it clear that this year we're well ahead of the pace even of 2007, which set the record for summer melt in the Arctic. Uh, if you've looked at those old pictures from the 60s of the first shots of the Earth from outer space, um, those are as out of date as my high school yearbook picture. There's 40% less ice up at the top than there used to be. Actually, I guess sort of, if I think about it. Um, our metaphor for bigness on this planet is the ocean. People didn't even think 20 years ago that there were, you know, the, the, not on the list of things that we could be doing to really substantially affect the oceans. But as it turns out, all that carbon in the atmosphere, some of it's being absorbed by seawater, and as it does, its chemistry is changing and changing quickly. As ugly as that hideous black slick spreading out through the Gulf of Mexico right now is, it's matched or surpassed by the invisible slick of acid that's spreading out across all the seven seas 
They're about 30% more acid than they were. And already, organisms at the bottom of the marine food chain are having a hard time making their living. Um, it's a horrible problem. The Earth's hydrological cycles, the way that water moves around the planet, are shifting and shifting very fast. The key, the key physical fact of this century may well turn out to be that warm air holds more water vapor than cold air. The atmosphere of the planet is about 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago, which if you think about it is an almost unbelievable change in one of the most basic physical parameters of the planet. What that means is, is that in real dry and arid areas, we're seeing more and more and more drought as evaporation increases. And those droughts are becoming epic. I was just in Australia and the water authorities in Australia said, we're not even going to call it drought anymore because drought implies that it will end someday and we think this is the new normal. Once that water is up in the atmosphere, it's going to come down. And when it comes down, we see these epic deluges and downpours and floods like nothing literally we've ever seen before. This winter in Washington, they had about twice as much snow as they've ever had before. That's what happens when you have record moisture in the atmosphere and the temperature is still below 32 degrees. As soon as it gets above 32 degrees, that becomes rain. Six weeks ago, it was Nashville. They called it the thousand year storm in Nashville that left huge places flooded out. A couple of weeks after that, it was the year's first tropical storm over Guatemala, Agatha, dropping absolutely record quantities of rain, hundreds of people dead. Uh, four days ago, it was Oklahoma City with nine or 10 inches of rain in a three hour period. Again, the thousand year storm. A couple of days before that, it was in Arkansas, 20 people dead in the campgrounds in Arkansas because the rivers rose past where they'd ever been seen before. On and on and on, someplace around the world now, every day, there's one of these hundred year storms underway and somebody suffering and suffering back. Even just the heat itself is fast, fast growing. Um, about two weeks ago, NASA said that we've just come through the warmest 12 months for which we have records, and they said it's almost certain that calendar year 2010 will turn out to be the hottest calendar year on record. Because we do this global organizing, we now have friends all over the world, and we're talking with them all the time as we organize things. Uh, we were on the phone with our friends in the uh, uh, in the Asian subcontinent the other day, about uh, about a week ago. Now, people in India and Pakistan don't really complain about the heat much because there's no percentage in it. It's pretty much always hot, you know, and they're used to it. But they were complaining that day. India is suffering the worst heat wave since the British started keeping records two centuries ago. Hundreds of people a day have been dying in parts of India. When we were on the phone with Pakistan that day, they just set the new all-time Asia high temperature record, 129 degrees. Um, um, the point is, things are spinning out of control and fast. That's everything that I've described comes with one degree increase in temperature, okay? One degree, globally averaged. Two extra watts per square meter of the sun's energy. We've got another degree in the pipeline already, carbon that we've already emitted. There's a kind of lag time before it's fully expressed because the ocean will hold that heat for a while. But the climatologists have made it very clear that unless we make this transition altogether from fossil fuel to what comes next in very short order, much, much shorter order than our political and economic systems want to do it in, that we're looking at five or six or seven degrees temperature increase before the century is out. That is not the worst case estimate, that is the consensus about exactly where we're headed. If one degree melts the Arctic, we do not want to find out what five degrees does. 
because there is no reason to think that our civilizations are set up to be able to deal with that kind of stress and that kind of change. All right, you can take a breath because I'm through the bad news mostly, I think. The good news, I guess, is that we have what we need to start solving this problem right now. And we have much of it here in this tent and on this fairground. 20 years ago, when environmentalists gave talks about these subjects, to a certain degree, we were doing it with our fingers crossed, you know, because solar and wind and things weren't quite ready for prime time yet, you know? It was still sort of noble, aging hippies down in the basement with uh, lead acid batteries and, you know, whatever else. It wasn't quite ready to sweep the whole country, but that's changed. All you have to do is stroll down the midway here to get some sense. And it's not just here, this same kind of burst of ingenuity and engineering all over the planet. I was in China about two weeks ago, um, and I was at the headquarters of uh, a company called He Min, um, uh, which is the biggest solar thermal company in the world. And I was talking with their president, uh, uh, a wonderful guy. Um, and he said, yeah, we've installed, we have about 60 million installed solar thermal units in China now. About 250 million Chinese get their hot water from the roof, you know? Um, that's about half of the world's total installed renewable capacity of any kind is Chinese hot water heaters. And it's remarkable to see that happening and see how quickly it's happening and see what the possibilities are. Ingenuity, engineering, isn't the issue any longer. And so I'm not gonna spend any time much talking about it. You all know how good you are at this sort of stuff. Just to walk up here to the hill and see where MREA is training people, contractors, every day about how to put in solar power and wind power lets you know that it's entirely possible. It's not the engineering and the ingenuity that we're lacking, it's something else, and that something else is the political will to make it happen quickly enough to matter. Okay. We had 50 or 100 years, no problem. We work through all the sort of cycles of new construction and things, and we get there. Uh, uh, we don't have 50 or 100 years, and that's the problem. We have to make this happen much, much faster. We have to force the spring, as it were, um, 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 if we're going to have any chance of dealing with those problems that I was describing. The only thing that will bend our political and economic systems quickly enough to get that job done even close to on time is if we're able to radically ramp up the price of carbon. If we're able to make coal and gas and oil carry the price for the damage that they're doing in the atmosphere, then that will instantly accelerate all this work. It will make it all enormously easier. But to do that, to do that means finally engaging in the political battle that so far we haven't been able to fight, much less win. A really decisive battle with those vested interests, the coal and the oil industries, that are the most profitable enterprises human beings have ever undertaken, and hence have enormous political power. Power that at the moment they are using to delay and defy action past the point where we can save this planet from the kind of temperatures that I was describing. So what I want to talk about for a few minutes is how we're going to build that political power in order to make the practical power that's represented here something that really works on a scale large enough to fundamentally matter. Now, before I begin doing that, let me just say that here I leave the realm of you know, confident statistics and 
expertise and things. Nobody knows really how to build political movements. Certainly not I. We've been jury rigging what we've been doing. We've been making it up as we go along. I'm going to keep speaking confidently just because that's what I do. But um, <laughs> be aware that mostly what I'm doing is telling you stories now to give you some sense of what we're trying. And we need your help desperately to figure out how to make these things work. I spent a long time just writing about all this stuff. Um, when I wrote The End of Nature, I was 27 or 28. And my theory of political change was that I would write a book and that people would read it and then they would go out and take care of the problem. And that would be that. And I could go on to something else. You know? um, it turns out, actually, that's not how the world works. Um, lots of people read it, you know, but the world kept going in its course. And at a certain point, that began to get to me. At the point at which it really began to get to me, I think, was uh, maybe five or six years ago, I'd been on a trip to Bangladesh, one of the most beautiful countries in the world, very crowded. It's 140 million people in an area the size of Wisconsin, so that gives you some sense. But they feed themselves. It's incredibly fertile. It's where the great sacred rivers of Asia, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, come pouring down out of the Himalayas across this incredibly verdant and fertile delta into the Bay of Bengal. So trees that would be, you know, uh, 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 50 or 100 years old here are a year or two old there. You can just watch stuff spring out of the ground. Um, it's a magnificent place, but they're in horrible trouble. Uh, uh, as oceans rise, and they're already rising, and they'll rise sharply as the century goes on, um, um, the Bay of Bengal is creeping in. The salt front is already making life hard and impossible for coastal farms. Meanwhile, the glaciers that feed those rivers are going to dwindle before the century is half out, and, and who knows what will happen then. But while I was there, those chronic problems weren't the main thing. They were having a very acute problem. Their first big outbreak of a disease called dengue fever, a mosquito-borne disease, that's spreading like wildfire across Asia and South America. The incidence up about 200% in the last decade. Because what do you know, mosquitoes completely dig the warmer, wetter world that we're busily building. Okay, And as they spread out, people are getting sick all over. When I was there, they were having their first big outbreak, and a lot of people were dying. So it was all over the newspapers all the time because people were scared. I was spending a lot of time in the slum, so eventually I got bit by the wrong mosquito myself, and I got sick. I got as sick as I've ever gotten. I highly recommend not catching dengue fever. But of course, I was strong and healthy going in, so I didn't die. I was in the hospital war just for briefly, because there's not that much you can do for you, but uh, uh, with, there's no treatment really for this disease. But it was a room far bigger than this, and it was filled with cots as far as you could see. And on the cots, there are just people lying there shivering, you know. And I remember sitting there looking at them, and my main thought was, God, is this unfair? Because when you measure, the UN tries to measure how much carbon each country in the world emits. You can't even get a number for Bangladesh. It's a rounding error in the calculation. The way that people get around is bicycle rickshaw. Most people aren't connected to the electric grid. They're not causing the problem, nor are the people in the Pacific Islands whose land is disappearing, nor are the, I mean, in fact, there's an almost perfect inverse relationship between how much of the trouble you cause and how quickly you get wrecked by it. Um, the 4% of us who live in this country produce 25% or so of the world's carbon dioxide. If there's 100 people in a hospital ward in Dhaka, then 25 of them are on us, or so it seemed to me. And when I came back from that trip, part of me wanted to do more than just write about this, and wanted to do more than, you know, I already had solar panels all over my house. We got a prize in our house for being the most energy efficient house in Vermont, you know. I wanted to do more than that because I knew that it wasn't adding up yet to what it needed to be. But I had no real idea how to do it. And I'm a writer. I live off in the woods in Vermont, the second smallest state in the country. 
Writers are not, this is not my natural habitat up here. You know, writers are people that are sort of self-selected to sit in their room and type, you know. I mean, it's just not, I called up a few of my other writer friends in Vermont, and I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go up to Burlington, which is our main city. Now, it only has 50,000 people, so it's not so main, but it's as good as we have. We're going to go up to Burlington, and we're going to sit in on the steps of the federal building, and we'll be arrested, and there'll be a little story in the paper, and at least we will have done something. And these other writers were as clueless as I was. a good plan. Let's do that. <laughs> But happily, someone called up to the police in Burlington. What will happen if we carry out this intrepid stunt? You know? And the police said, nothing will happen. Stay there as long as you want. So I was like, damn. We have to recalibrate. So I started, I sent out emails to everybody I knew and said, we're going to go for a walk. And we left about two weeks later. We left from Robert Frost's old summer writing cabin, because he's sort of our patron saint in Vermont. And we walked uh, for five days. We'd sleep in fields at night. I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so I called up all the kind of Methodist mafia to make sure there'd be potluck suppers along the way. Um, um, we finally get to Burlington, and there's a thousand people marching. Now, you all are from relatively cosmopolitan and sophisticated places, you know. Um, so to you, a thousand people sounds like nothing. But in Vermont, except for University of Vermont hockey games, you know, a thousand people is as many people as ever appear. So it was enough to get all of our candidates for office. This was the fall of 2006 come down and meet with us. They not only met with us, they signed this raggedy piece of cardboard that we've been carrying hither and yon that said they'd work to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2050, which at the time was a very radical target. Only scientists were in favor of it, you know, not politicians. But they all signed, and not just the liberal Democrats, of whom we have some in Vermont. The woman who was running for Congress on the GOP ticket almost won. She had said two months before, when she announced for office, she'd said, as too many people, she said, I'm not sure global warming is real. More research needs to be done. Okay. Well, it turned out that the more research that needed to be done was on the topic, how many people will walk across Vermont and ask me to change my mind? You know? And empirically, a thousand was sufficient because there she signed. It's exactly how it's supposed to work, and bless your heart, the only bad part was to open the newspaper the next morning and read this story that says this thousand people was probably the largest demonstration about climate change that had yet taken place in the United States. When I read that, I thought, no wonder we're not getting very far. We have kind of the superstructure of a movement. We've got Al Gore, we've got scientists, we've got policy people, we've got economists. The only part of the movement that we forgot was the movement part. There's no anything there to give it any weight, you know? Maybe we should try to build it. So we started, and when we started with nothing, me and six kids at Middlebury, we had no money or no list or anything. We just started sending out emails, and it turned out, we said to people, to organize something like this for April of 2007. And it turned out that there were people all over the country, and I'm guessing that some of them are in this tent, who were just like we were, who were like, we changed the light bulbs and we figured out that that actually wasn't going to solve the problem. But we were daunted by the scale of climate change. It seemed so big. How do we do anything really effective about it? But who were willing to take a flyer on the thought that if they were doing the same thing that people all over the country the same day were doing, it might work out or it might at least help. And so on that day in April, three months later, we had those 1,400 demonstrations that, that Julie referred to. And it was beautiful and creative. And it was pretty effective. Three days later, both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton changed their energy and environment policies and adopted this 80% by 2050 goal as they ran for president. Okay. That was good.
was good. We were, in fact, feeling, I think the technical description would be smug um, about what a good job we'd done. Okay? The only problem was that six weeks later, the Arctic started to melt for serious in the summer of 2007. I spent that summer getting phone calls from scientists I had known for a quarter century who'd always been worried, and now they were panicked. Um, it wasn't just the Arctic, it was every system we were looking at was beginning to go really off the charts. By the time that summer was over, it was clear two things. One, our old targets weren't by now, were by now obsolete. What happens in 2050 is of far less interest than what happens in 2020 or 2015, okay? The second thing was, it was pretty clear that if we were going to do this effectively, not only we were not going to do it one light bulb at a time, we probably weren't going to do it one country at a time either. It was going to have to be one planet at a time or not at all. And that was a kind of daunting realization because really almost nobody even tries to do global organizing. The globe is a big place and people have the inconvenient habit of insisting on all speaking their own languages everywhere, which makes it deucedly hard to you know, come up with a movement, a slogan, anything else. That's why we were both horrified and elated in January of 2008 when our greatest climatologist, Jim Hansen at NASA, and his team put out a paper. And that paper said, we now know enough from paleoclimatic observation and from real-time observation of things like the Arctic to be able to finally put a real number on this peril. And that number is 350 as in parts per million CO2. In fact, as they said in the abstract of that paper, so I can remember this, any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Okay. That's strong language. And it's stronger language yet when you know that right here, right now, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 is 390 parts per million and rising about two parts per million per year. That's why the Arctic is melting. That's why the ocean is turning acid. That's why it's 129 degrees in Pakistan. Okay. So it's horrifying. But for us as organizers, it was also, in a sense, a great gift. Because Arabic numerals actually move across linguistic boundaries with ease. 350 means the same thing in Warsaw that it does in Wisconsin. Okay, And that allowed us to at least imagine how we might try to do some global organizing. Not that we really knew how, and not that we really had any resources. Um, but by now, the seven kids with whom I was working had all graduated from college, which was a good thing. Um, there were seven of them, which was the right number, because there were seven continents. So each one of them took one. Uh, the guy who got the Antarctic also got the internet, because it's sort of its own continent. And off we set to organize, which in our case means sort of finding people like ourselves who are worried about the same things, and who don't need to be organized very much, and who don't need to be paid, and who don't need to be coerced, who will do the kind of work themselves where they are building that kind of organization. Some of them were environmentalists. Some of them around the world were people interested in public health and human rights and agriculture and all the other things that are called so quickly into question by this disintegrating um, 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 climate. What we told people was that we needed one day to sort of introduce this to the world, um, to push really hard, and we wanted everybody to do something, whatever they were going to do, on the 24th of October last fall. We really didn't know how well it would come out. We um, gathered in a couple of borrowed offices down in New York about a week before, just to kind of almost to you know do the last minute chores, send out press releases and things, but to kind of wait for the returns to come in, because we told everybody they needed to upload images right away to the web as soon as they had it. 
we got the first sense that it might be going to work in the middle of the week. And I'll tell you this story just to let you know how we organize. We got a phone call from um, these two sisters in, in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. Now, we've done these training camps around the world for young people mostly. We did one in Turkey for Central Asia and one in the Caribbean. We've done one in Johannesburg for people from all over Africa. We brought one or two per country down there. Most had never been in an airplane before or anything, but they were born organizers. They're great. Then they fanned back out across Africa. We didn't hear much of them for the next six months because the internet's still pretty notional across Africa. You can't just Skype people all the time. And since we had no money, we were dependent on things like Skype to do our work. But we knew they were organized. Now Wednesday, we got a call from one of these sisters in Ethiopia. She was on the phone, and Isha, and she, she, was, she was really upset. She, our government, Ethiopia, has, uh, I think, what's technically called a not nice government. Um, um, uh, our government has told us that we can't do this thing on Saturday. You know, they've denied it. So we're, we're doing it today in advance uh, before they can tell us we can. Really. And we're so sorry because we know we're jumping the gun. We know everybody's supposed to do it at the same time on Saturday. We're so sorry. We hope we're not spoiling it. And we have 15,000 people out in the street right now. <laughs> We were like, Isha, it's okay. You've done, you've done good. Don't worry. Um, um, and in fact, it was really good because that pictures from that allowed us to sort of prove to CNN and wherever this was going to be a big deal. And after that, they just started coming in from everywhere. Two or three hours later, completely unexpectedly, we got a picture from American soldiers in Afghanistan. And they made a huge 350 out of sandbags. And they sent us a note saying, we're parking our Humvees for the weekend and walking where we go. And after that, it was just insane. The pictures just were just coming in from everywhere. And before the weekend was out, as Julie said, there had been 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. CNN said it was the most widespread day of political action on any issue in the planet's history. It was really beautiful to see. I hope that you will go look at some of the pictures at 350.org. Um, you'll see some great pictures from around Wisconsin and around the Midwest. But what you'll really see is what your colleagues and comrades look like all around the world. And the most interesting thing about those pictures is that they don't look like what you'd expect. I've spent my life hearing that environmentalism is something for well-off white people to do once they've taken care of their other problems. <laughs> Almost everybody in those pictures is poor or black or brown or Asian or young, because that's what almost the whole world is made up of, okay? And what do you know, they care just as much about the future as anybody else. It was incredibly beautiful to see those pictures, to see there's a couple of hundred from places like Yemen and Saudi Arabia that are just women in full burqa, you know, having big demonstrations. There are, you know, around the Dead Sea in, in, in the Middle East, uh, since they couldn't actually cross the borders to work together, all our Israeli friends made a big giant human three along their beach, and in Palestine a huge five, and in Jordan an enormous zero. It was incredibly beautiful and moving. People saying, we're going to put aside some of the things that divide us. We had incredible participation from faith communities around the world. The week before, one of my, my favorite uh, religious leaders, the, uh, the Patri Patriarch Bartholomew of the Eastern Christian Church, who has about 400 million followers, gave a sermon in which he said, and he spoke with, it seems to me, Midwestern forthrightness, um, said, global warming is a sin, and 350 is an act of redemption. Okay? <laughs> aided our organizing across a broad swath of the planet. Just like that all over the world. It was really something. Now I wish I could tell you that this solved the problem. Okay. 
we got incredible coverage. We owned Google News for about 36 hours, which meant it was the most linked to story around the world. It's on the front page of almost every newspaper in the world. We went to Copenhagen six weeks later with real momentum, and it was really wonderful in many ways to be there. Uh, uh, big, there's big church service in the middle of the in the middle Sunday of that two-week conference at the cathedral in Copenhagen. Archbishop Tutu from South Africa came to preach the sermon, and at the end, they rang the great cathedral bell 350 times, and then 3,000 churches around the world did the same thing that afternoon, and it was beautiful. We convinced 117 nations to sign on to this 350 target. The trouble is that they were the wrong 117 nations. They were the poorest and most vulnerable nations on earth, and the richest and most addicted, led sadly by our own, weren't yet ready to grapple with the dimension of this problem in any real way. And so those two weeks ended in a fizzle. And I was sad and angry on that last day, I must confess, of that conference, because it really wasn't the way that the movie is supposed to work out. The world had it teed up, you know? It was a chance to prove that the big brain was a good adaptive idea, you know? I mean, it was a real moment that we should have seized, and we did, that I was sad and I was angry, which is why I was glad we brought the largest delegation to Copenhagen, not surprisingly, 350 young people from all over the world, people like those sisters from Ethiopia. And they'd done a great job organizing, but I was especially glad that they were there on that last day, because they kept coming up to me, you could see how upset I was, and really one after another kept saying pretty much the same thing. And remember, these are people, many of them coming from places, much poorer places, where power is a little more naked and where one's not allowed to be quite as innocent as we are in this country sometimes. And they kept saying, look, we didn't really expect to win right away. We've been organizing for a year. We're up against the most powerful force in the world, the fossil fuel industry. We're just going to have to go back and get stronger and bigger and keep this fight going. So that's what we're doing. And that's where we need your help and need it very much. On the 10th of October, 10, 10, 10, so no excuse for forgetting the date. Okay. <laughs> On the 10th of October, we're having the next big thing, but this time, not a global political rally like we did last year. This time we're having, and you'll see why I'm so happy to be right here, this time we're having what we're calling a global work party, okay? In thousands of places all over the world, people are signing up with their groups and in their communities to do something of great practical value that day. And it depends where they are, what they're doing. Some places they're putting solar panels up on the roof of the community center uh, uh, so that people will be able to have light at night to study for the first time. Or they're putting up windmills. Or they're digging community gardens. Or if they're in the, uh, you know, in this hemisphere, they're harvesting community gardens and having some kind of community supper, or they're laying out bike paths, uh, uh, or they, and we just heard from our friends in Auckland who said that they're going to make sure that day they're rounding up every mechanically minded person they can find by day's end. They're going to have every bicycle out of every garage in Auckland and working so that people can use them, you know. Um, things like that in every corner of the earth. Now, it's not because, sadly, we can solve this problem one solar panel at a time, one bike path at a time. Those things will help. They're good things to do. They'll be incredibly practical and useful. But the math doesn't add up. We will address this problem, if we address it, the day that we have a national and an international agreement to raise the price of carbon in some fundamental way. So, so 
This work party is designed not only to do this practical thing, but also to send a political message and frankly, a kind of sharp political message. The message will be to our leaders, we're getting to work, what about you? You know, if I can climb up on the roof of the school and hammer in a solar panel, then I expect you to climb to the floor of the Senate and hammer out some legislation. Now! Because in the end, this is a purely practical problem with which we're faced. It is not, in the end, a debate between different value systems, between liberals and conservatives, or Republicans or Democrats. It's a debate between human beings on the one hand and physics and chemistry on the other, okay? And that's a bad debate to find yourself in because physics and chemistry, my guess is, are not going to renegotiate their position. They've pretty much laid down their bottom line. You want the world to work the way it works? 350 parts per million. Take it or leave it. And when they say that, they mean it. They stand up and walk away from the table. That's what we've got to meet. And we've got to stop doing the kind of pretend political games that we've been doing for too long. So get to work is the theme, the idea, and in thousands of places, and I hope that every one of you can think about how you can make this happen in your place. There'll be something great going on in your community, and there'll be a sign that says 350 next to the solar panel, and we'll have those pictures, and you'll have invited your congressman, and we'll be able to make some real hay with it. And you will have the sheer pleasure of knowing that whatever you're doing at that moment, thousands of other communities are doing the same thing. Many of them in places where it's much harder to be doing this kind of thing. Some of them in places where people are taking at least a little bit even of political risk by doing this kind of thing. Now, if I was a good organizer, I would just stop right here because you're ready to go. I can <laughs> My problem is that at heart I'm a writer, which means that I'm compelled to tell you the truth as best as I can see it. And the truth is, there's no guarantee that this is going to work. There's no guarantee anything's going to work. No guarantee. There are scientists who think we have waited too long to get started and that this heating has taken on a kind of irreversible momentum. Most scientists still think that while we will not stop global warming, we may be able, if we act with great courage and speed, to hold it to a level that will be difficult but not impossible for civilizations to deal with, to stop short of that five or six or seven degrees. There are political scientists who think that it's impossible, that the vested interests on the other side are just too strong. And that could be. So far, they've been right. If you were a betting person, you might be well advised to make that bet. But it strikes me that that's a bet that we're not allowed to make. That the only moral position for people who happen to be alive at the moment when the worst thing that ever happened is happening, and who happen to know what to do about it, that the only moral position is to do everything that we can to try and change those odds at least a little bit with no guarantee that it's going to come out okay, but with great faith that, at the very least, we will have done everything we can to improve the chances. So no guarantees at all, except the guarantee, and I bring it to you from people all over the world who I've gotten to know in the last couple of years, that we will do absolutely everything we can until the last possible minute in that fight. And it is a great honor for me to be in a tent full of people who are already deep in this fight, and I look forward to fighting alongside you in the years ahead. Thank you. Yeah.